I've had to remove every single social tie. I had severe PTSD from this. I, I contemplated suicide, it got really bad. You feel like any little piece of information that gets out on you will be used by the worst people on the internet to destroy your life. And it's so isolating. And terrifying. It's horrifying. I'm so sorry. <laughs> It's really hard. And do you guys see how video manipulation and AI, we are just at the beginning of this thing and how it is going to change us and confuse us and marvel us and everything else? For those of you listening to the audio podcast, that was uh, obviously manipulated video of Barack Obama and Joe Biden as women, and it looks pretty damn good, and it sounds pretty damn good. And we are just at the like prenatal stages of what AI video can do, and just wait till they have video of the President of the United States announcing a nuclear bomb has been dropped, we entered World War III, COVID-9 is here, and, and it's all fake. Like We have so many things on the horizon that we have no idea how to deal with. But uh, around here, we deal with them the best we can. My name's Dave Rubin, this is The Rubin Report. It's March 20th, 2024. We're live streaming on Rumble Locals and YouTube. Share, subscribe, tap that notification bell if you have not. Post game show, rubinreport.locals.com. You can join for absolutely free and for a couple bucks, you can communicate with us, keep us independent, all of that good stuff. We've got a big show for you today. Uh, I really loved the first clip we're showing you today that's gonna set us up for the rest of the program. Uh, Kevin O'Leary, uh, Kevin O'Leary, Shark Tank host Kevin O'Leary uh, was on CNN. I don't know if he's a CNN contributor at this point, but he's on CNN often and he is a rare voice of sanity on CNN and he really went off on uh, what this New York case where Donald Trump is being uh, demanded to pay about $440 billion uh, and have his business license taken away and everything else. O'Leary just absolutely went off on the state of New York. And we're gonna connect that to just sort of watching law and order collapse uh, and Western values collapse, not just here in New York and more widely in America, uh, but there's a few things coming out of Scotland, coming out of Ireland and other parts of Europe uh, that are hugely, as the kids say, problematic, and we've lost control of the algorithms and all of that stuff. However, there's also something else happening, which is that I, and I've been hitting this hard for the last couple of days, and, and if there's any way that we can get out of the uh, this abyss that we're in right now, it's that more and more people will wake up to the fact that DEI is not attractive, hyper, uh, sexualization and racialization of everything is not good. Judging people by the color of their skin, also not good. There was some guy that said that a long time ago that people used to be into. And we've got to figure out a way to build a better future and an, and an alternative future than this dystopian nightmare that these people have been leading us to. So that's what we're doing today. But real quick, let me talk to you guys about Gravity Defier shoes. Guys, let me share my recent discovery with you. G Defy shoes, that's G-D-E-F-Y shoes. Let me tell you, they're simply amazing. No, 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 they're beyond amazing. G Defy is a footwear company on a mission to relieve knee, back, and foot pain. Now, as many of you know, I've struggled with my knee from balling all these years. Although, Joey, how about that finger roll in the game the other day on Monday, huh? It was, yeah, I was up there, man. But from the moment I slipped into my G Defy shoes, the pain just vanished. How does G Defy achieve this ultimate comfort? Firstly, every pair comes with free custom orthotics to align your body perfectly. Then there's their patented VersoShock trampoline technology in the heel, which absorbs harmful shocks and provides positive renewed energy, empowering you to tackle your day. Additionally, G Defy has integrated a strong structural system into your shoes that improves your posture and encourages you to walk using your calf and other major muscle groups. Don't take my word for it. Read the countless customer reviews raving about the pain relief and amazing comfort they have experienced with G Defy shoes. I, for one, can't get enough of them, and I wholeheartedly recommend them to anyone looking for relief. Experience the comfort and pain relief for yourself. Visit gdefy.com today and use code RUBEN30 for $30 off orders of 150 or more. And now back to me. So let's just uh, dive right into it. Uh, before I get to this O'Leary clip, I wanna just catch you up on what is going on with Donald Trump and New York, because this is clown court circus nonsense. We've got some info from the Daily Wire. 
The lawyers representing former President Donald Trump said on Monday that their client has been unsuccessful in his attempts to secure bond for Judge Arthur Engeron's $464 million civil business fraud judgment against him and his company. I think I might have said billion at the top of the show, million. Uh, Trump's team submitted a filing in the New York Appeals Court saying that despite Trump's efforts, Shurders wouldn't accept real estate as collateral, meaning the Trump organization much, must come up with around $1 billion in cash to continue to operate, the Wall Street Journal reported. The lawyers argued in their filing that posting bond for the judgment's full amount is a practical impossibility. These diligent efforts have included approaching about 30 surety companies through four separate, separate brokers, a bond requirement of this enormous magnitude, effectively requiring cash reserves approaching 1 billion is unprecedented for a private company, the legal filing added. Okay, so let me just editorialize for one moment here, which is you might be going, and I saw a lot of this nonsense on social media, and I heard a bunch of it on corporate press and all that, well, Donald Trump's a billionaire. We thought he's worth several billion dollars. How does he not have this 464 million or a billion dollars cash just to put over? That's not really how it works when you have a lot of money, right? Your money is tied up in all sorts of things, in assets and a whole bunch of other stuff. So it's not like there's just cash just sitting there. That has, that's putting aside the fact that this whole judgment is insane and they're only doing it because he's running for president and they're also making him more popular while they're doing it, et cetera, et cetera. But now let's check out uh, Shark Tank host, uh, Mr. Wonderful, Kevin O'Leary on CNN, basically explaining that we are now going down banana republic road to hell. I don't think this case is about Trump anymore. I think this case is about New York. It's about the American brand. It's about what we promised the world in terms of fairness and justice and investing capital in the country that's built the largest economy on earth. Forfeiture, seizing of assets. Is that in our nomenclature in America? Is that what we tell people that want to bring their money here and protect property rights? Forget about Trump. Nothing to do with Trump. You think this is good for business in New York? You think this is good for business in America? to take a law that we use to protect people against buying refrigerators at an overpriced value decades ago and apply it against an individual and then talk about seizing assets like he was in Venezuela hmm. or in Cuba. This is well, a ask... very, very, very bad look for New York. And everybody around the world is watching this. This may be well, great for the attorney general, but this is I not good you. for America. Kevin, I hear you, but, uh, you know, I don't like Trump. Um, of course, Kevin O'Leary is right. Let's not forget, Donald Trump also was found guilty of defamation of E. Jean Carroll, not of raping her, as they have said repeatedly on mainstream media, but defamation as it relates to her accusing him of rape. He's never been convicted of rape. I don't know why he didn't sue her for defamation. If someone says you're a rapist and you're not, it seems like you should sue them. That seems like defamation. But putting that aside, you can clearly see what's going on here, which is that Donald Trump is the presumptive nominee to be the Republican nominee and likely president of the United States because Joe Biden has dementia and nobody likes him and we're all watching the economy and foreign policy and everything else fall apart and they are doing everything they can to stop him. Like that, that's just obvious, right? And it's not like, Five months ago, I was Mr. Trump, rah, 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 right? I voted for him last time. I thought there was another path to go down. But as they do all this, it's like, I can't wait to vote for the freaking guy at this point. And I think a lot of people feel that. This is absolutely unjust. But even putting that aside, O'Leary's broader point about what this says about New York and the United States at large, we have been the dream of the world. Right? We were the shining city on the hill, the United States of America. Come here with nothing, right? You're, what, all the immigrant stories, we came here with one bag, we had nothing but a dream, the streets were paved with gold, and then we made more people rich than, than the world could ever imagine. We built the most robust middle class, all of those things, and New York, New York, which is now rampant with crime and drugs and all of that stuff that you know about. New York, which has insanely high personal income tax, and business taxes and everything else, 
are, is watching people leave in droves. I think in the last two years, about 450,000 people have left New York. They don't want to pay the high taxes. They don't want to run businesses any there, there anymore. Imagine if you were just opening up, forget Donald Trump and hotels and everything else. Imagine if you were opening up a brick and mortar store, whatever it might be. It's a restaurant, you're selling sneakers, doesn't matter. Well, now you got a couple problems, right? Because you got high regulation in how you're gonna open the store. You got high taxes on, on all the income that you make. You have personal income tax as well. And by the way, oh, every now and again, there's gonna be a Black Lives Matter or a Hamas rally that might break your windows. Oh, and if you get involved in some uh, political situation, they might seize all your assets. So no, but nobody, nobody with their head on straight will want to do business in New York anymore. That's how it is, but O'Leary continued. But in terms of the valuation, can you be clear as to why, I mean, why would the properties not be sufficient collateral? What a great message to send out all around the world. Take a claim where there was no monies lost. For, there, was no, there was no fraud here in the context of actually people losing money. Deutsche Bank who made the loan was made whole. And let's make a penalty of half a billion dollars against a, a, a crime, apparently, where no monies were lost. Great message for New York. Great message for America. Bring your capital because we'll protect your property. I think that was a statement that would be much better made sometime in Venezuela. I'm not kidding. That's a scary, scary message. And by the way, there are uh, again, no such thing as half a billion dollar bonds. The marketplace. There are no half a billion dollar bonds. Never been done before. Never. This law has never been applied. Forget about Trump. Nothing to do with Trump. Everything to do about America and the New York brand. I love this state. My children live here. A horrible message to everybody around the world watching this. Absolutely horrific. Well, this wait, Kevin, Kevin, but, but hold on a second. Kevin, Trump what will we be the, gone one day. Hold, this hold attorney's on a second. general I, will be gone one day. And this I is what you want to tell people around the world. I have a wonderful voice and it won't be talked this over. Hold, Kevin O'Leary, I would like to this hear what you have to say. But America. What are you doing? I, not but, America. It, but it, it's not, not America. America. I have a wonderful voice and it won't be talked over. Who watches this shit? Uh, Kevin O'Leary is fantastic. We, we've got to get him on the show because, again, I don't even know if he liked Trump before all of this. He's And he goes out of his way to not make this about Trump. He's making this about what is America. This case, which is largely, it was largely uh, set up as the, the accusation was that Trump overvalued some of his properties to get these loans. Now, as O'Leary points out, the banks got paid. Everybody's whole here. You, when you get a loan, you all know this, anyone who's bought a house, when you get a mortgage, you don't just pick how much the mortgage is for, right? If you buy a million dollar house, let's say you have to put 20% down, that means you have to put about $200,000 down and now you need an $800,000 mortgage alone. Well, you don't just walk up to the bank and say, I want $800,000. They value the home. They send someone, they look, they're like, oh, this house has a roof and walls and actually the neighbors are okay and it's in a pretty decent neighborhood. We look at some comps. Some of the houses that look like this are 1.2, some of them are 800. All right, about a million sounds right, we'll give you the 800,000. You can't just make up the number and that's what they're claiming Trump did. But even, even putting that aside, the banks got paid back. So what is really happening here? Well, this is, as I said, this is banana republic level stuff. This is Venezuela level stuff. And Donald Trump got interviewed by Nigel Farage at Mar-a-Lago. Mar-a-Lago, which by the way, they now have valued, this is what the Letitia James and the rest of them are saying, is worth $18 million. Mar-a-Lago is on, can we find out how many acres it's on? It's, I think it's about 20 acres if I'm not mistaken in West Palm Beach, I've been there. It could use some repair. He could throw a little money into fixing it up, but on the beach right over there, the property alone is worth easy 50 to 75 million, like 18 million. It's just absolutely absurd. It's on 17 acres, okay? The acres there easily are 3 million each. Like it's just complete nonsense. Anyway, uh, here is Trump being interviewed at Mar-a-Lago by Nigel Farage about what's happening right now. They valued Mar-a-Lago. Yeah at $18 million. I mean- Because the courts are rigged. What's going the on? The courts are rigged, they did. They valued it, it had an appraisal at 1.5 billion, 1 billion, 2 billion, who knows what it's worth. It's worth, because that was good for their narrative. So they valued it at $18 million because 
It's a crooked legal system, very crooked. That's why people are leaving New York. Companies are fleeing New York because of even this decision. They're leaving New York. And no, they come after me because I'm in the election. If I didn't run or if I was in fourth place or fifth place or ninth place, uh, there'd be no, uh, no, no attacks. And if we don't win, I'll tell you, I made the statement the other day, November 5th, that's election day. Yep. Not that far away. November 5th is going to be the most important day in the history of our country. With that being said, seven months is a long time when you have somebody as destructive and incompetent as this president. That's a long time. A lot of bad things can happen to our country in that sense. Yeah, he's right. Look, that's Trump at the top. It's him being a little sloppy. It's worth a billion or two billion. It's like, come on, man, you can give us something a little, but whatever, that's just, that's Trump being Trump. I can get past that. But he's right, we got seven months till this election and we are watching the system do everything it can to get the, really, I would say the front runner at this point. I mean, every poll is showing that, the front runner out of the way. And of course he's right. If he was fifth right now, if there was still a robust Republican process happening right now, a Republican primary process, and he was fifth, this would not be happening. They have added the fuel to, to push him forward. The conspiracy version of that would be, oh, they've done, they're doing all these cases to get everyone to back him because they know he's gonna lose because X amount of people also hate him and he lost last time and all of that stuff. But all of that aside, this is banana Republic level stuff. And he's right, businesses are fleeing New York City in droves. I might only recommend any of you walk around my neighborhood in Miami where everyone's coming from New York and I damn well make sure they're gonna vote the right way. And by the way, there were elections in Florida last night and the Republicans crushed everywhere. If you didn't think we were red enough over here, even in Delray Beach, which Biden won by 27 points last time, they now have a Republican mayor for the first time in a long time. So good things are happening in Florida. But now I wanna connect this when Donald Trump always says this thing, they're not just coming for me, I'm, I'm just the one standing in the way, they're coming for you, I'm standing in the way. I wanna show you this video that went viral. This is from a New York City uh, homeowner. Uh, this is a news report about a New York City homeowner who was arrested for changing the lock on their own home because squatters broke into the house. So the squatters broke in and there is some crazy law in New York that you as the homeowner can't change the locks. This is, this is absolutely Wild. Here, this guy just forced himself into my house. No, he did not. Yes, he did. No, he did. And he so did you. Man. You broke through the front door. Officer. The man called the police on her. So why is it that I have to leave and he doesn't have to leave? Because technically he can't be kicked out. He needs to go to court. They consider this a landlord-tenant issue. And by law, it has to be handled through the housing court, not with police. If you own this house, you would not want I her inside. I don't own house. I don't own this house. Exactly, yes. she does. Yes, but then once again, you should know how the law works. I and do know how it there's, works. There's rules to the as you gotta go to court and send me to civil court. He says he signed a lease in October, but wouldn't tell us with who. I got proof longer than that. Show us the proof. But who are you for me to show? I showed it to cops. Dan with Channel 7 News. If you don't want to show it, you don't I'll want show to show you it. Come here, brother. I like that. I, I, would, I would like to see it. He didn't show me a lease. This, this is, is a bill. Is a bill for work he says he had done to the house. He didn't show police a lease either. The police department doesn't have the lease? No. He's got no documentation. Just bills. So, Adele, you're getting arrested right now? I'm being arrested. For what? For being, a for being in my house, man. For being in my own home. And, not, and where's your lease? She's fighting the house. It's not her house anymore. My deed That's is current and legal. Arrested for unlawful eviction. She changed the locks on a man who claims he lives there. Okay, so this is just one little example, right? We don't even have to get into the weeds on all of this. That woman owns that house. That guy's a squatter. He has no lease, et cetera, et cetera. And she's being arrested. So do you see how these things can be connected to the Trump thing? We are doing this weird thing in this country where we protect the bad guys and we try to take out everyone good. And how much longer can a society do that? Like how, how, for how many years can a society do that? Protect the criminals, don't do anything about the people who are stealing all the stuff from the stores, let the people smoke crack on the streets, like watch everything slowly collapse, punish the good people because they pay taxes and then we'll give their tax money to illegals. Like if you just scale that for a while, what do you think is going to happen in the long term to any country, not just the United States, right? But this is happening all over the world. We're gonna get to some of the craziness happening out of Scotland in just a sec. Let me talk to you guys about TWC Health 
real quick. Guys, are you planning a family vacation? Keeping your loved, your loved ones safe and healthy is a top priority. That's why the Wellness Company's Emergency Travel Kit is a must have for every family trip. Family adventures come with unique and sometimes pesky challenges, which is why the Wellness Company's trusted team Medical experts, including Dr. Peter McCullough and my buddy, Dr. Drew Pinsky, designed their travel emergency kit to provide peace of mind when traveling. Packed with six prescription medications, essential over-the-counter medications, a comprehensive guidebook, and even medical supplies, the kit ensures that you have peace of mind and the best care available wherever you go, so you can sit back and enjoy your trip. Don't risk getting caught without it. Head over to twc.health slash Ruben today and get your own travel emergency kit. That's twc.health slash Ruben and use promo code Ruben for an exclusive 15% discount. Don't risk a ruined trip. Order your kit today. And now back to me. So, okay. So this idea of going after people who we shouldn't go after and protecting criminals and allowing illegals in and all of the things that by default punish the good law-abiding citizens, tax-paying citizens. It's not just happening in blue states and it's not just happening in the United States of America. It's happening all over the world. Check out this story out of Scotland. This is absolutely wild and I guarantee this was not played on CNN, MSNBC, Probably, well, no, I, no, it probably was on Fox. I, I, I don't want to go that far. Uh, or most of the mainstream media places. To, uh, this is from Ian Miles Chong. Police officers in Scotland are being given training to target social media posts, including retweets of material deemed threatening and abusive. Under the country's new hate crime law, actors and comedians are not given a free pass to make jokes about sensitive subjects that offend people either. The new training provided to officers, which was leaked to the Herald, requires police officers to go after anyone who produces material deemed threatening and abusive, which can also be communicated through public performance of a play. Under the new hate crime law, people who make fun of or misgender trans people, make racial jokes or criticisms of certain religions or criticize migrants can be prosecuted. The different ways in which a person may communicate material to another person are by displaying, publishing, or distributing the material. For example, on a sign, on the internet, through websites, blogs, podcasts, social media, etc., etc., either directly or by forwarding or repeating material that originates from a third party through printed media such as magazine publications or leaflets. The hate crime law goes on to state that giving, sending, showing, or playing the material to another person Listing examples such as through online streaming, by email, playing a video, through public performance of a play. So repeat a joke you heard online or show someone a spicy meme or commentary of a transgender person or mass migration on your live stream and you too will be arrested. This is absolutely wild. This is happening in Scotland right now and it is a big, big problem to say the least. Do you think if we remove comedy from society, we will become more tolerant? Do you think if you stop people from joking around or sharing memes or, or going to plays that are a little edgy, do you think this fixes anything or does it make everything significantly worse? A member of parliament, Pam Gossel, uh, tweeted this. Uh, Reportedly, police Scotland's officers are being told they should target actors and comedians under Humza Yosef's new hate crime laws. This dangerous law needs to be banned uh, ASAP. I should mention that Humza Yosef, uh, if you haven't seen my interview at the ARC conference with Douglas Murray, he really went off on him. Uh, he's Pakistani originally, so he's Pakistani now in Scotland, pushing for laws to stop the Scottish people from making jokes, et cetera, et cetera. He happens to be married apparently to a Palestinian woman. You might, that's just interesting context uh, when it comes to immigration and cultural sensitivities and things of that nature. I wanna throw you back to something that we showed you a couple months ago though, because it's not just Scotland that is having major problems here. Uh, here is video of Irish Prime Minister Leo Vardikar, who uh, recently was complaining that Irish institutions were too white. Um, Connor, you're Irish. Pretty, pretty, pretty white. And one thing I strongly agree with the deputy on is the need to target, set a target to have a, a number of people from ethnic minorities in areas of the public service. We have a health service that's very diverse, although less so as you go up towards the senior positions, uh, not so much in the Gardaí, not so much in the defence forces, not so much in the education sector, as the deputy mentioned, not at all in the civil service, which is very white. 
including the Department of Equality, for example, uh, and that actually needs to change. Um, so we need to have, I think, a target for people who come from ethnic minority backgrounds, uh, but also uh, dedicated recruitment campaigns to encourage people, because we do need uh, a generation of young people growing up in Ireland who are people of colour to see black and brown school principals, judges, Keen Corla perhaps in the future. Um, who knows? Uh, visibility uh, and opportunity. I mean, it's just like this pathetic, guilty nothingness. It is okay if largely Ireland is filled with white people who are Irish and drink, like to drink a pint. It's okay, right? It was just St. Paddy's Day here. I had a Guinness. I haven't had a Guinness in about three years. And it's not as filling as you think. It's deceptive. You know what I mean? You think you're drinking something that's going to be more like a milkshake, but it's actually, uh, it's lighter than I thought. Anywho, um, interestingly, we found out about five minutes before the show today that uh, Leo over there, the Prime Minister of Ireland, is now the ex-Prime Minister of Ireland. That's right, he resigned today, apparently about a half hour ago. We're working on getting some video that we'll show you at the end of the show. Uh, but these people that, that you're allowed to stand up for your country and your values. You're allowed to be in Scotland and say, okay, you know, I'm gonna make jokes about different things. It's okay, and I'm gonna offend some people or put on a play that might be a little bit edgy. You're allowed to be in Ireland and be white. It's okay, it's absolutely insane. Now I've got an interesting twist on this one because there's another video that was going viral over the last couple of days. This is out of the UK. And here is a Muslim woman and she's actually explaining that multiculturalism and importing all these people and everything else, she's a Brit. She's a Brit and she ain't happy about it, which goes to show that ultimately the people who are pushing DEI and multiculturalism and everything, they actually hate the smallest minority, which is the individual, which is exactly what this woman represents. Take a look. What politicians doing, everything is doing. I think there is a big responsibility of the Muslim community in that because we have, uh, we have tried to change the British. It is, totally different now. It's nothing like Britain before. You know, it's, uh, it's everybody's like doing their own thing and they want to adapt everything. So this country's own culture has disappeared. You know, and I think this is something that needs to come back if we want to be, uh, you know, feeling the important. Because, you know, if the British uh, society changed to another, other countries, uh, you know, rules and religious expectation and everything, then you cannot expect you know the Britain, you know politicians to be British to you. Yeah. So, so this is interesting. So you think Britain has been too accommodating, almost? Yes, it is. And I think this multicultural everything coming into it has made it like the society has changed to everybody's adaptations. Yeah. Like everybody's doing their own thing. Schools and everything. You know, they're like having different kind of holidays. Everybody's having different kind of, um, you know their own adaptations. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, if you go to uh, Tower Hamlet's council uh, and you want to speak to someone about, you know, before I would go to council and I would see that they would expect it and they understand me. But now they would be like, oh, in your culture it happens, so adapt to it. Isn't that great? And that is why the smallest minority, as Ayn Rand said, is the individual. That woman is an individual. She happens to be Muslim and she's saying it is a problem because we, she's, in this case she's saying we, the Muslim population, have, sub, have really altered the British psyche, right? We've altered British culture. Um, so in some ways it's kind of, watching that video, it's like inspiring and depressing. It's inspiring to know that people like her get it and are out there and are fighting for individual rights and in this case fighting to be a proud Brit, that's wonderful. It's also depressing because her quote exactly was, we changed the culture. And the question is, can the culture change back? So it's like every weekend when we show you these Hamas rallies and there's hundreds of thousands of people quite literally chanting for genocide, supporting a terrorist organization and everything else, like what do you think will happen as time goes on as those people gain more power? Will Britain be more British or will it be something very different? So you gotta give credit where credit's due. The people that have come in and brought all of their traditions and everything else and decided to just beat the British people over the head with it and into submission, they kind of did it. That's what she said, we changed the culture. She's not happy about it, but that's what she's saying. Anyway, we'll connect this to much more that's going on in our institutions because uh, Jonathan Haidt, who I've had on the show from NYU Business School, uh, who's been one of the, uh, I would say 15 years ago, he was warning that a lot of this stuff was coming. He was on Joe Rogan 
uh, just yesterday and had a couple interesting things to say. But real quick, let me talk to you guys about fume. Guys, have you ever tried to break a bad habit? Oh, like you're climbing Everest and flip-flops? Yeah, we've been there too. But here's a breath of fresh air. Fume. It's not about giving up, it's about switching up. Fume takes your habit and simply makes it better, healthier, and a whole lot more enjoyable. Fume is an innovative, award-winning, flavored air device that does just that. Instead of vapor, fume uses flavored air. Instead of electronics, fume is completely natural. And instead of harmful chemicals, fume uses delicious flavors. You get it. Instead of bad, fume is good. If you're, if it's a habit, you're free to enjoy and makes replacing your bad habit easy. Your fume comes with an adjustable airflow dial and is designed with movable parts and magnets for fidgeting, giving your fingers a lot to do, which is helpful for de-stressing and anxiety while breaking your habit. Plus, Fumes just released a magnetic stand for your fume, so there's no more losing it around the house. It's built with fidgeting in mind. You can spin your fume around on it. I've got it right here. Look at that. You can spin this thing. It's a magnet. It's incredible. Go to tryfume.com slash Ruben and get the journey pack today. Fume is giving listeners of the show 10% off when they use code Ruben to help make starting the good habit that much easier. And now back to me. All right, so let's just jump right into it. Uh, Jonathan Haidt uh, from NYU Business School, uh, who has been on the forefront of warning about identity politics and everything else. Some of you may remember when I was waking up to the why I left the left, when I was just starting that thing, this is around 2014, uh, and the Rubin Report was just taking off. He was like the fourth guest on the show because everyone said, you've got to talk to this guy. He's warning about it. Well, yes. and he was on- the result of that yeah. in terms of people terrified about people attacking them is what you get when you got those people from Penn, from Harvard. Mm-hmm. We're talking yeah. about the this rampant anti-Semitism on campus Mm -hmm. where people were actively calling for the death of Jews, saying that this does not constitute harassment unless Mm -hmm. it's actionable, which is just stunning, insane. Right. It's not wrong unless they act on it. What is that like as a person when, when, you know, you are an academic and Mm -hmm. you are a professor, when you see that Mm -hmm. from these, especially from somewhere like Harvard, like it just. Yeah. So, so yes, I'm a, professor at NYU. I was at UVA for 16 years. I love being a professor. I, I love universities. Uh, I'm also Jewish. And I can understand the argument that those, that those presidents were making. The argument was a very narrow technical argument uh, about whether students should be allowed to say from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. Um, and so I understand why it, was, it would have been reasonable for them to say, well, we're not going to punish students for saying that. That is political speech that's protected under the First Amendment. Um, So I understand the point that they were making, but they were such screaming hypocrites in making that point because, and this is what the Kotlin American Man was all about. How did it happen that, you know, if if a professor or administrator writes a single word that that a student objects to, and calls racist, suddenly this person now out of a job. Like, really? Like, you're gonna fire someone or let someone be tormented and fired because they said something um, that someone interpreted in, in a certain way. So for the presidents to say, oh yeah, you know, anything anyone ever said between 2015 and yesterday would be punished if anyone was bothered by it. But from the river to the sea, oh yeah, sure, that's constitutionally protected. It wasn't protected. just from the river to the sea, it was yeah. the literal expression, yeah. death to Jews. Yeah. Yes, that's right. And that's and call, yeah. what they were specifically no, you're right. defending, saying you're right. you're unless right. it's actionable, yeah. which is insane. Unless you that's commit right. actual genocide, yeah, is right. that what you're saying? That's right. No, I'm sorry. You- By the way, you can go one step further than Rogan's actually going because Jonathan Haidt is is using the First Amendment that definition of free speech, right? Except this, when when we played these videos for you a million times, when those congressional hearings were happening, uh, and they were asking the presidents of Penn and Harvard and MIT about these hate speech codes. It wasn't about the First Amendment. It was about the hate speech codes at the university. Each university, much like each corporate atmosphere, they have a guidebook on what what are what do we allow here? What do we allow here? And unbelievably, Harvard was basically going to allow, uh, you can kill all the Jews as long as you don't actually do it. If you start killing some Jews, we're gonna have a problem, but you get it. There has been a mass movement of propaganda through education and then, the trickier part now is that it has been fueled through social media. Uh, so here, Hate and Rogan talk about TikTok and how it's influencing American young people. What most, what most alarmed me when I, when I heard the, the, um, the Tristan Harris podcast um, was the, the ease of influencing 
American kids to to be pro this or pro that on any political issue. Right, you're seeing that us. with uh, Palestine and Gaza. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, you're you're definitely seeing that now. It's it's very it's very obvious. Well, it's it's very obvious with many things uh, with TikTok, um, trans stuff, and there's a, there's a lot of different things that they're encouraging. And, you know, people that are opposed to that are, are being banned, which is also very odd. And specifically, like, female athletes. We had Riley Gaines, mm -hmm. who was the female athlete that competed against Leah Thomas. And she has said that male, biologically male athletes should not be able to compete with biologically mm -hmm. female athletes because they have a significant advantage. And she was banned from mm -hmm. TikTok just for saying. All right. So why is TikTok banning people from saying that? In essence, girls or boys are different, and that's okay. That's why you have girls sports and boys sports, because if you combine them all into one thing, it would be all boys crushing girls all the time. And why are the algorithms fueling this, right? So it's the bad ideas that we know took root in the institutions over decades ago, but then really, it's interesting, because Rogan seems a little, like, a little like, how can this be in Harvard? But it's like, of course, the places that are thought of as the smartest, are ultimately going to come up with the bad ideas. You know, I played a video a couple times over the years of Dennis Prager talking about, well, how, did, how is it that the Germans, uh, who had really the, the most elite education in the world prior to 19, you know, 1940s, prior to World War II, uh, how did they build such an incredible society and then have that society also turn ultimately evil? There's a lot of evidence that the more that you, not that education is bad, education is great, but once it becomes uh, ideology rather than education, you're going to send people down a really bad path. And then you combine it with these algorithms. So now TikTok and China, they know, boy, we can cause a whole, we don't need to invade America to destroy America. We can actually just hand every freaking kid. Well, they're going to hand it to themselves. The parents will hand them this thing. And boy, we could put some stuff on this thing that might confuse kids about their gender. And then you'll have eight-year-olds who don't know if they're boys or girls. And you'll have a bunch of 12-year-olds that think they grew up in a racist country. And you'll have a bunch of 16-year-olds that think whatever else they want them to think, that somehow socialism is good and everything else. Uh, but of course, much of this always boils down to this trans issue. So now I wanna show you a video from the weekend over at South by Southwest in Austin, Texas, and Dylan Mulvaney, who is a, a man uh, who now, you know, uh, is a character actor as a woman. Uh, here he is talking about how he loves TikTok because it's normalizing transness for kids. And now with transness, I'm hoping that it's the same trajectory of like, you know, the people that are being so outwardly transphobic online in my comments, in my DMs, I'm hoping that that will become like increasingly embarrassing for them and that these media organizations and these social platforms will be equally embarrassed that they tolerated and allowed these things to happen and didn't step up when we needed them most. Um, but I also think about how specific to TikTok, because I still am like, what is this app? What am I even doing? I think it's it's a way for young people especially to see people that are like them. And I, I remember um, kind of one of the only characters on television was uh, Kurt on Glee was like the only feminine type of person that I, I even could connect to. And that wasn't even a trans character growing up. And so I, a lot of the times will like watch a video and be like, I wonder what my younger self would think about this. Um, and that's why it is so powerful. Okay, so it's interesting because... I think it's actually okay for young people to see different people and understand different things and know that people live different lives and everything else. And if there was a trans person that lived in my community that treated me with respect, uh, I would treat them with respect and all, all of those things. Most people have made it to that place. The issue that we are now talking about is how they are teaching this stuff to young people who are impressionable and confused about a whole bunch of other things. And that we know that the transness is just a, it's just one little like breadcrumb that they've laid out into a whole bunch of other breadcrumbs that turn them into far left woke communists basically. That is the bigger problem. Uh, another person who, who apparently is trans uh, is Elliot Page. Elliot Page used to be actress Ellen Page. You know, why don't we show the picture of actress Ellen Page first? I don't know if this is gonna get me booted off YouTube, but she was absolutely beautiful. Phoenix, you had a huge crush on her, right? Phoenix had a huge crush on her when she was in X-Men. It's okay. Was it an X-Men, that the crush? Inception. Inception. Okay, so Phoenix used to have a crush on Elliot Page. There you go. But she was Ellen Page at the time. 
Anyway, she was a beautiful young lady. Okay, fine. And, and she was good in those X-Men movies, which I actually, nobody talks about the X-Men movies. I thought they were pretty good. They're pretty good. Days of Future Past, very clever. Anyway, uh, she now is Elliot Page. You may remember that Jordan Peterson was banned from Twitter for calling, uh, calling Ellen Page, no, calling Elliot Page, Ellen Page, and then I got banned from Twitter for just commenting that Jordan did that, and then they found that in the Twitter files when I met uh, when I met with uh, Elon up at Twitter headquarters in San Francisco. Anywho, here is Elliot Page uh, talking about how we've got to get rid of rid of traditional gender norms. Besides, we have quite a straight jacket of what we're supposed to be. I know you've spoken about this in in Hollywood as well. You know, yes, and for cishet people, of course, as well. And that's why I'm like, oh my god, why can't we all just connect on this, right? We're all just inundated from the moment we're born. Some people even have parties before that <laughs> about oh the gender reveals exactly like how how you should be, how you should look, what success means, like all of those things. We're all facing all facing those pressures. There's a sort of culture war playing out in which trans people have been kind of put in the middle of. And I just wondered how you feel about that. And it, when it comes to the devastating impact of um, what politicians and, and governments are doing and saying it's uh, uncomfortable is an understatement. Um, it's actually uh, horrific and has like extremely devastating consequences for a community that already really struggles to just exist. Phoenix has a crush on Elliot Page. Um, okay, put, let me try to do this not cynically and not sarcastically and everything else. Look, um, I, I suppose that I hope that Elliot Page, the person who, who's in that video, Elliot Page, whatever surgeries, all of the stuff that, I'll even grant him the, the uh, pronoun for a moment, that he has done I hope on the other side of this thing, the woman that we knew as Elliot Page, who now is, you know, let's say the man we know as Elliot, as Elliot, the woman we knew as Ellen Page is now the man we know as Elliot Page. And let's just say, I hope he's okay, right? It doesn't really look it to me, but like, I hope that he's okay. But that doesn't mean he's right about anything that he says there. Um, because it is not that the trans community is under attack. Nobody is going after trans adults or kicking them out of country clubs or anything else. This is about what they are doing to children that has been pushed every freaking which way, right? It's happening at schools, it's happening through media and everywhere else, but they love victimhood above everything else and that is the problem. Anyway, let's jump back to Dylan Mulvaney because Dylan Mulvaney was, and Dylan Mulvaney I have no need to, to call a girl because I think, she, I think he has abused actually what a girl is for a million reasons and gotten quite rich doing it. Uh, Dylan Mulvaney was at a diversity, equity, and inclusion panel at South by Southwest over the weekend, uh, talking to uh, a couple other panelists about how it's, it's DEI ultimately that will produce the best stuff for society. Like almost everything you're gonna hear here is complete backwards, enjoy. Old ways of thinking was that, uh, no, no, we're just gonna treat everyone the same. We should be celebrating the trans community. We should be celebrating the Hispanic. Like all of those communities have rich histories and contributions to not just culture, but to business. There's, there's a, um, a German philosopher from the early 19th century, his name was Hegel. And he came up with something called the dialectic method as a way to explain how innovation and change happens. And his philosophy was basically every idea has an equal and opposite idea. And when the two ideas collide, they create a new one that consists of the best of the two. Mm. I look at DE and IB, I look at how we are working together in different consumer segments as an opportunity to bring these cultural experts together to create something even bigger. There are things that I will learn from Dylan and her experience as a white trans woman that I would never experience as a black gay man. And I'm not going to experience it the same, but my God, I'm learning something new. And that's where innovation happens, right? That's when the big ideas come out. 
I've never had a client say, I don't want more innovation. Mm. I've only had them say, I want more. I want less innovation. They've only said they wanted more. Mm. So that's kind of where things are moving, I think. And that's where the smart people are, are tapping into. All right, so that gay black man who I thought was a woman um, just said a whole bunch of nonsense. They seem to connect all of the goodness about you to this immutable characteristic. You are trans. Ironically, trans is quite mutable in that you can change back and forth, but your sexuality, your skin color, all of those things. But it has nothing to do with how you will build great things. Basically, he's saying, oh, if you want to build great things, you want to really create a great society, you would have to have all of these people doing all of these things, except they're putting the most unimportant part at the top of the hierarchy, right? So like, let's say you took that panel of those four people there and you were like, okay, let's build a bridge. Well, no one by definition of their skin color or sexuality or anything else knows how to build a bridge. You would want to have the best engineers. Do you think when they were building the Brooklyn Bridge about 150 years ago, they were like, guys, guys, can we get a trans black woman here? Somebody, can somebody get me a trans black woman? I cannot work with all these white people. It just makes no sense. It's not to say that you can't be a great engineer if you're a trans black woman. You know what, find me a trans black engineer to get on this show. That's what we're gonna do. Of course you can be. <laughs> it's so fluid. But if you are just putting groups together to do things based on the most unimportant stuff, you will never accomplish the important stuff. Now, the good news of all of this, guys, is that not only is this fella wrong, um, but DEI outcomes have been an absolute flop, which is why they're being pushed out of institutions right now. Corporations are getting rid of them. We know that even BlackRock, like they're reversing on some of this stuff because it's not about appearance. It's about performance. And the more that you push this nonsense down everyone's throats, the more they wake up to it. So I wanna show you a trailer. I think we're gonna keep me on camera here. Uh, I wanna show you a trailer of a movie that just came out. It's called The American Society of Magical Negroes which I'm fairly certain if I had said that myself a year ago, you'd, they'd throw me in jail. You're not allowed to say that in Scotland, I'm sure. Uh, but here's a trailer for a movie called The American Society of Magical Negroes. And let's watch the trailer because it did not do well at the box office. Uh, it Should I tell the people now or should we watch it? For, yeah, it made just $1 million its opening weekend in the United States. Uh, and it made 310 on a Sunday, which was a collapse of 34%. So here they are. It's just This is just another thing that that Hollywood pushes out. It's the hyper-racialization of everything. And let, well, let's take a look at the American Society of Magical Negroes. I know you can feel their discomfort, Aaron. Watching you walk through a room full of white people was the most white painful thing I've ever yeah, seen. Yeah, just walking through Sorry. a room full of white people. I don't want to take oh you to a God, job in like There's that. a recruiting class starting right now, and we got to get you in it. Welcome to the American Society of Magical Negroes. It's like Harry Potter for black people. This is incredible. I don't really understand. It's easier to say. What's the Whoa. most dangerous animal on the planet? Sure. White people, when they feel uncomfortable. Oh. White yes. people feeling uncomfortable precedes a lot of bad stuff for us. That's why we fight white discomfort every day. Because the happier they I are, want everyone to be the racist. safer we are. The name is really a little updating, maybe like magical black people, or I guess that doesn't have the same ring. Get ready. Oh, wow. Your first client is a Jason Munn. His morale is far too low. Hey. Hey. Darn it. I was hoping there was a station right next to him. Oh, is this one spoken for? Oh, nope. so the magical black person. Yeah, it's actually fun and weirdly relaxing. It's like being person. a secret agent with none of the danger. Hey, oh. I'm Lizzie. Nice to meet nice you. Nice to meet you. Is she she's racist great. or she's yeah, a little she's cool. dark skin? Come on, oh, man. She's, she's cool. smart and funny. And... I know what you were doing going on about her. You're trying to set us up. No, no, no. That's not what I was doing. You cannot have a relationship with Lizzie now. Because if you don't put Jason first, everyone's magic will fail. I've always felt like it's my job to make white people feel comfortable, and here it literally is. But maybe it shouldn't be. I got a great plan to ask her out, but I'm gonna need your help. Do you think you can like work your magic? Hey, are you talking about me? Hey. Oh my. Wait, are oh, you? Oh, the white guy. But I'm traveling long way. Yeah. Someone defied the society. Who was it? You didn't let her go like I told you. If you interfere with her or your client, you could have your memory erased. You won't even remember she existed. 
Even though we might never see each other again, I need you to know that what we had was real. I'm curious to see how you're gonna make it out of all this. Okay, you're not gonna see that movie. I'm not gonna see that movie. The only reason I put you through that was because that movie, which was marketed just like every other movie in the United States, and it's full of this woke bullshit that nobody cares about anymore, only made a million bucks on opening weekend with a 34% collapse since Friday. So the good news is that DEI is wrong, wokeness is wrong, and yes, they can fuel it through algorithms and they can get activist teachers to push it to all the kids in schools, except when reality uh, comes around and people have to put their dollars down on something, Yes, a whole bunch of black people turned out to be racist or a whole bunch of black people turned out to hate magicians. There aren't that many black magicians, generally speaking. Remember we used to go to the Magic Castle in LA? Very rare to see a black magician there. Makes you really, makes you... Anywho, let's uh, shift to some sanity to end the show today. Uh, I want to show you two videos from the ARC conference that I was part of in London a couple months ago, which of course was Jordan Peterson pulling together some of about 500 of the best academics and media people quite literally in the world to make sense of how to get out of this. Because all of our societies, whether they're Scotland, whether they're Ireland, whether they're the US or they're the UK, we are hanging on by a thread. And I don't, uh, my biggest fear actually, especially having been in Israel last week, where they, they are a serious society that takes their problems seriously and has, has serious problems to deal with. Most of us in the West are not serious people and we're not dealing with our problems seriously. And when our problems get worse, God only God will have to help us, I suppose, to get out of these problems. Uh, here is the wonderful, I actually believe she is an angel. Here is the angel, Ayan Hirsi Ali, uh, explaining how we can fix Western civilization. What I, the quotes that you just had about, uh, you know, Western civilization is a cut flower and cut flowers die. That is true, cut flowers do die, but what we have in terms of Western civilization is a lot of seed packets. And I want to send you off with these seed packets, which you find in libraries, which you find in you know, w wise people like you, like Roger Scruton, like all these other people that I mentioned, uh, in statues. We have the remnants, the symbols of Western heritage and their seeds. And all we have to do, those of us who inherited it and enjoy it, is to go and seed them, grow them, nurture them, water them, and when they're attacked, fight for them. Wouldn't have been great at the end of that if she had snapped her fingers and been like, Negro magic, and then disappeared. <laughs> like that. The point of showing you that, guys, is that it is not because Ayan is a black woman or an immigrant or anything else that makes what she said true. It's true because it's true. We have the right pieces. We have, especially in America, we have the right founding documents. We have all of the right stuff to fix this stuff. We just need the will to do it. And I wonder if we will do it. Uh, but there's another guy, he was on that stage right there. He happens to be white and male and middle-aged. So, you know, take this with a grain of salt, I suppose. Here's white guy Jordan Peterson just telling the truth. That's what's happening to the young people that we see who are adrift. They're taught to be nothing but self-conscious, to do nothing but think about their immediate needs, to refer to themselves as the locus of all things, and there's nothing you could do that would make them more miserable. It's identical with the instruction in misery. And you want to be outside yourself, serving a higher purpose, and maybe you're cynical about that, but you can think about it technically. Well, why do you bring a fork to the table? Well, so that you can put a plate beside it. And why do you put a plate at the table? And it's so that you can set the table to serve your family, to share food, to bring together the people you love in something approximating harmony as a microcosm of the entire cosmic order. And you can replicate that at every level of complexity all the way up to what's at the pinnacle. And that's all real. And so is what's at the pinnacle. And we've forgotten all of that. And as a consequence of forgetting that, we've forgotten the responsibility that we need to bear in our life to make our lives bearable. And we've forgotten the meaning and the adventure and the purpose and the significance and the, and the earned self-regard that goes along with that sacrificial attitude. And we've forgotten to tell our children the same thing. And we could remember, we could remember who we are. 
We can remember who we are, and that's what this conference was for, to remind people, everyone who attends, who you are, right? You're the... the, the that was the single best speech I have ever heard Jordan Peterson give. I did about 120 shows with the guy. I've seen him a million other times. I've watched a gajillion other videos. Uh, if you have not seen that whole speech, it's only about 35 minutes. It was the end speech of the ARC conference. Uh, we have that up on our YouTube channel. Can we make sure we get that in the, uh, we'll, we'll put that in the, um, in the description so you have a direct link for that. But do you see the connection there? When you hear these people like Dylan Mulvaney and that gay black man or whatever it was, or, or Ellen Elliot, whatever, they're navel gazing. They're navel gazing all the time. What is it about me? And what is it about me, 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 me? And that is the direct same thing that you would do to a child if you wanted to depress them. Or you could get them to look up. And if you got them to look up, they might realize that, oh, they happen to be gay or happen to be black or happen to be trans or they've got a little bit of a limp or whatever it might be. But there's a world out there. If they try to do something great, maybe they can. And even if they never accomplish the exact thing they were going for, the journey has a little something in it for them. I think that's probably it. And to prove now uh, that if you have all of the wrong ideas, it does not work out for you in the, wrong, in the long term. Well, we showed you that video about 20 minutes ago of the Irish Prime Minister, Leo Vardikar, uh, talking about how Ireland should be more black and brown. Well, congratulations, he has just resigned. It happened about a minute before we started the show, and apparently we've got some video. I have not seen this before. When I became party leader and Taoiseach back in June 2017, I knew that one part of leadership is knowing when the time has come to pass on the baton to somebody else, and then having the courage to do it. That time is now. So I am resigning as president and leader of Fine Gael effective today, and will resign as Taoiseach as soon as my successor is able to take up that office. See you, Whitey. You tried, you failed. Don't let the door hit you on the way out. All right, guys, that's our show, post-game show. In about 30 seconds, rubenreport.locals.com. Uh, my interview with Isabel Brown, my co-host on People of the Internet, is up right now. Her brand new book came out yesterday. I've got it right here, and yes, where am I? Where am I? I'm over here. Yours truly wrote the forward. You want to check it out. Uh, Ruben Report Show on the Twitter. That's our account if you want to just get little bites of the show. We leave you with a man. It's hard to say what his name is. Some call him Chuck Schumer. That seems a little generic to me at this point. Some call him Cuck Schumer. Some call him Fuck Schumer. Some call him Schmuck Schumer. You decide for yourself. Adios. But make no mistake, there will be a trial, and when that trial ends, senators will have to decide if they believe Donald John, Donald John Trump incited the erection, insurrection against the United States. <laughs>